Hello, everyone. Um, welcome to the International Documentary Association's uh, conversation around Belly of the Beast, moderated by IndieWire's Kristen Lopez. We're super excited to have you here. My name is Cassidy Diamond. I am the Public Programs and Events Manager here at the International Documentary Association. And before we get started, I'd like to begin, as we always do, with a brief land acknowledgement. Um, today, I am coming to you from Chicago on the unceded land of the three fire peoples, the Ojibwe, the Odawa, and the Bodawadmi. I would also like to thank um, IndieWire for their support in bringing this screening series to all of you and with support from KCRW as well. We have, uh, we're going to be taking a break here in December, so we have just a handful of these coming up and then we'll pick back up in January so you can see all of our upcoming screenings and conversations at documentary.org slash screening series. And without any further ado, I'm going to bring Kristen up here so we can begin this amazing conversation. Hi, Kristen. Hi. Hello, everybody watching. Uh, I'm so excited to get to talk about this fantastic documentary, uh, Belly of the Beast. I'm Kristen Lopez. I am IndieWire's TV editor, and I'm also a published author, film critic, jack of all trades. Uh, but enough about me. Uh, let's talk about our amazing panelists and introduce all of them here. So I'm going to, of course, start with introductions for our the documentary's fantastic director and producer, Erica Cohn, as well as producer Angela Tucker. We also have two, I hate to use the term film subject because that seems like such a microscope term, but they are documented in the documentary, uh, Cynthia Chandler, who is the co-founder and executive director of Justice Now, hello Cynthia, as well as Kelly Dillon, who is an advocate for violence prevention. Hello everybody. How is everybody surviving quarantine at the moment? Good, as good as we can be. Yeah, it's yeah that's hand. about right. <laughs> <laughs> well, I am just, you know, you probably hear this a lot, floored by the documentary. I think it's it's such a, a brilliant film and a topic that is not discussed enough. And I'm so excited to get to talk to you amazing ladies about it today. To kick things off with, you know, Erica and Angela, can you talk about how you came to this story and how that translated into wanting to document it in the finished product. Sure, thank you all so much for, for having us tonight. I wish we could be at the IDA screening series in person. It's such a special screening series. So appreciate being able to share this digital space. Um, so Cynthia and I were first introduced in 2010 through a mutual friend. And I was really inspired uh, by Justice Now's let Our Families Have a Future campaign, which essentially exposed the multiple ways that prisons destroy the basic fundamental human right to family. One of the most heinous, of course, being the illegal sterilizations primarily targeting women of color, which really screamed eugenics to me. As a Jewish woman who grew up in Salt Lake City, you know, the phrase never again was always in the back of my mind. And when I learned about this different kind of genocide that was happening through imprisonment, through forced sterilizations behind bars, I knew that I wanted to get involved. And initially, that was as a volunteer legal advocate. Cynthia invited me into the organization. And from there, I provided direct service needs for over 150 people inside California's women's prisons. And together we began collaborate on, collaborating on a project that ultimately would become Belly of the Beast. And in the beginning stages, the idea was really to chronicle the incredible human rights documentation process that was going on inside prison that was funneled out through this amazing underground network of activists through allied organizations like Justice Now. And that all changed when I met Kelly. 
I had heard about Kelly's incredible activism through my work at Justice Now, but didn't actually have <laughs> a chance to meet her until a couple of years into the process. And at the point that we met, Kelly was working as a community interventionist doing gang intervention and domestic violence prevention work and wasn't at that point in her life interested in talking about the sterilization abuse, but wanted to get involved kind of behind the scenes as an advisor. So very early on, Kelly was a tremendous resource in kind of advising the process of, of documenting these human rights abuses. And then again, that all changed in, in 2013 when the Center for Investigative Reporting released their incredible reporting. And there was this tremendous momentum, a national conversation, a series of hearings, potential legislation. And that was the moment that Kelly was really almost called back into the movement and um, asked to testify on behalf of so many other people who couldn't. And that was also the moment that Kelly and I decided that, that we would start filming um, a little bit. And um, from there, I mean, it became very, very clear that the film really needed to center around her story and her relationship with, with Cynthia. And as you see in the film, I mean, if it wasn't for Kelly, none of this would have happened to begin with. If it wasn't for Kelly's um, initial discovery and also advocating for others, there wouldn't be a film, there wouldn't be the, the investigation that Justice Now did, the, the series of reporting. I mean, there wouldn't be a bill, none of this would have happened. Um, I came on the project about, I guess now four years ago, uh, and Erica, had been, you know, filming for a long time and had kind of these long relationships with everyone on the project. We met at a film festival. She showed me some footage and really I saw a part of Kelly's interview and that's when I knew I had to be a part of the film. Uh, you know, as a Black woman, I had heard about forced sterilizations happening, uh, particularly Fannie Lou Hamer is an example of someone who um, in 1965 had um, been forcibly sterilized by a doctor and they were happening so often in Mississippi they were calling them the Mississippi appendectomy. So that's kind of one example of the history behind that that I had known about and always thought someone should make a film about this. And then I saw uh, you know, Erica's footage and knew that I had to be a part of it. So that's when I joined the project as a producer. This one, this next question is for whoever wants to, to answer. You know, for me as a disabled woman, the concept of forced sterilization is, is you know, an, nightmare you know it's it's a very real fear that i've always heard about and when we watch in the documentary there is a, a horrifying moment where you're showing the social media responses of people mm -hmm. who believe this is acceptable why is it in 2020 as we talk about how progressive quote unquote that we've got, we've become that there are is still a, a large subset of people that believe that it's this is acceptable this is an acceptable thing to do Kelly, do you want to jump on that first or not? <laughs> okay. Um, I think, and this is just, you know, my opinion, um, that we haven't dealt with the under root, the root issues underneath this kind of sterilization abuse and eugenics. And that's why it keeps popping up. And, you know, white supremacy, um, ableism, uh, misogyny are at the root of our culture and our society. Um, they were omnipresent at the founding of this country and they haven't gone away and they affect all of our institutions, including our family structures and who has the right to have or not have children. Um, and we haven't dealt with this. And in fact, we've rendered it so invisible in a way because the communities targeted for sterilization are also vulnerable and rendered invisible frequently um, that people don't even know what the word eugenics is when we started doing this work when kelly and i started doing this work which was really now 20 years ago <laughs> a long time um, when when i would you know meet with people even in the prisoner rights community the uh, legislative uh, world and I would ta start talking about eugenics it was clear people didn't even know what that word was and several times people actually stopped me and said wait I, it doesn't seem like a perfect environment I'm like no not utopic eugenic like they literally didn't know what that was what, what that there was a whole history of trying to design a master race 
in this country, which fed into uh, many other countries, including Nazi Germany's uh, desire to create an Aryan race. Um, and, that, and, that, and that's one of the reasons it's perpetuated. And we're seeing it bubbling up in so many ways. Certainly with COVID, we're seeing the demand to sacrifice medically vulnerable people and elders uh, to further the economy. Um, and it, it, it pops up all the time uh, with lack of access to health care for the most vulnerable people. And what I, what I started thinking about at least 10 years ago now is how what this really is about is it, it's bubbling up in such a massive way is about rising fascism. Um, and it's no mistake that we're seeing the rise of white nationalism at the same time that we're starting to see more and more and more eugenic pronunciations in, on, the, on a public scale. <laughs> I was muted. Kelly, I don't know if you want to add to that or, or not. Yes, um, I'm, yes, it's, it's hard to follow uh, Cynthia because she is so powerful and knowledgeable. But it, it's, it goes back to like the way I look at sterilization is also the way I look at incarceration is who you seem to be unfit, right? Who do you label as a burden to the economy? Who, um, who is a public nuisance. So the guy that's hanging on the corner or, you know, maybe drinking or causing some mischief, right, is looked at as the same, is really looked at by society and by, like you said, white supremacies and those that are empowered, the same as somebody who is disabled and trying to cross the street. You know, it, it's, it's, it's the way like you say, you're wanting to have this perfect society, this perfect race, and it's just who's, who is deemed fit, who is deemed fit to engage in that society, who is deemed fit to reproduce for that society, and it's just, it's the same as what um, Cynthia said, yeah. Can I add that this is a really yeah, important, yes. this is such an important moment for this issue uh, around um, both disability, uh, rights and the threat of sterilization, forcible sterilization of people with disabilities, as well as people in prison. I mean, there, there is an assault right now on the right to abortion access. And one of the primary ways that uh, the radical right is trying to whittle away at reproductive rights in general is to start with whittling it away with vulnerable people, people like Kelly, you know, Kristen, people like you with disabilities, right? And um, it's no mistake, it's strategic. It's designed to be able to open up the door to whittle away reproductive rights. And, and the rhetoric around that and the campaign around that is also why we see such horrible comments coming out, right? Um, where the media is sort of feeding and fr building a frenzy um, around this issue to try to render acceptable the destruction of reproductive rights for broader and broader populations. Well, to go off of that, of course, you know, documentaries take a, a bit amount of a good amount of time and timing mm -hmm. tends to to be uh, something that can either be a good or a bad thing. Of course, this is coming out as we're dealing with everything that is 2020, uh, including Black Lives Matter and Erica's your documentary, of course, is mentioning that forced sterilization tends to happen to, to black and brown women far more than it does white women. What was it like to realize that you were going to be putting out this documentary kind of at the height of of these discussions that we're having now well i think it's important to note that this film i i like to call it our film it's been a tremendous collaboration um from the very beginning i'm so lucky to have worked with cynthia and kelly for for the past 10 years and angela uh, and our incredible producing team for um many years on this project. And I think all of us, when the, you know, the pandemic hit, were very, um, were very interested to see how, how we would be able to pivot from having an entire impact campaign that was very targeted, you know, towards in-person screenings, in-person events. And, um, you know, I think all of us probably have a different perspective on this. I mean, we talked as a, as a collective so much about how this film would be timely in this moment. And 
um, Angela and I decided to actually move up our broadcast on, on Indo PBS's independent lens to ensure that the film would be accessible in this moment. We chose to have a DIY theatrical and to move forward with, um, with our theatrical release instead of waiting for a distributor who might actually hold the, the film until a later date because it was very important that the film was accessible in this moment when we are seeing how alive and well eugenics really is. You know, as Cynthia and Kelly have mentioned, we are witnessing systemic racism and population control through policing, through imprisonment, through the immigration detention system, and through lack of access to healthcare during the pandemic. So I'll, I'll let others um, speak about this kind of decision um, as well. Um, for me, I'm going to go into a, I'm sorry, Angela, I'm going to go into a different direction. But to me, I just felt like it was fate, right? It was destined for this moment because initially we were looking at 2019 as to being the release of the film. And then we were held back um, for maybe some editing reasons and some other technical reasons we were held back. But then when COVID-19 hit, you know, you know, Erica, I, Cynthia, and Angela, we were talked about like, oh my goodness, like how is this, like is the message that we're trying to get out, um, is it going to be overshadowed by the pandemic, right? Like, because we, we want to make sure that people, we have people attention. And then, this, then the uh, racial and social and civil unrest and racial um, um, unrest kind of happened. So then now we're dealing with the COVID-19 and then we're dealing with George Ford murder. And so we were like, okay, oh my God, like all of this is going on. But like I told Erica, I told the team, I said, no, this is the perfect time for this discussion because in this film is we're tackling all of these issues at one time. Um, and everything she said, like just how... Um, Med, like medically how people of color are not being given the medical care or the um like the the accessibility to it like others have just so many different things systemic racism and um how that plays out in the different layers of our systems and our government and our society so i just really felt like it was supposed to be released at this time and and, I, and, I, and look at and look at the response. I don't believe that we would have gotten. I, I, I trust in the film. Don't get me wrong, but I just think that it just hit different um, platforms in a in a way that it was needed for this time that we probably wouldn't have reached just if we was releasing theatrically. But the way that um, our team, also the media, our media team, how they've also been such such like dynamic. Um, just a, such a dynamic team, how they've gotten to bring in, um, yeah, different platforms that we wouldn't have probably even been looking at if it wasn't for this time. So that's what I was saying. I just want to add one thing. I know a lot of filmmakers are watching this. I know this is like a, a lot of the audience for this. And um, words of wisdom, I would just say, around um, if you are finishing up a film and trying to, you know, uh, think about how to put it out in this world, is it was really for us being focused on who is the audience for this film? What did we make this film for? Uh, and I think people can get really mired in um, festivals and theatrical and kind of things that aren't necessary, that that might be why you've made the film. But for us, we knew that we really wanted this film to be available to communities who, to people who need to see it and to organizations who can utilize it. And so um, that actually made the decision-making process pretty clear because if that's what you say this is all about, you then can't hold it back for kind of arbitrary status reasons. Mm -hmm. You have to really put your film on the path that it needs to be on. And that's a hard decision for some people to make, but it's an important decision. You know, along the lines of what Angela just said, I think it was important to the whole making of this film that the film team was so incredibly mission driven. Um, and, you know, as I said earlier, Kelly and I have been working on this for about 20 years. We've kind of grown up with each other. <laughs> and, uh, um, and Erica's been working with us also for, you know, a decade. Um, 
And honestly, if Erica hadn't been willing to come in and do a really unusual thing of really embedding herself in the movement and in the campaign, um, I wouldn't have trusted her as an activist. And I, Kelly can speak about this, but I doubt Kelly would have uh, trusted her as a survivor of this harm. And it was, you know, it was not even just um, how can we trust uh, Erica as a ally to people in prison and people of color, but also like, how can we trust Erica as an ally to this movement? Um, when, you know, 10 years ago, if you brought up the concept of prison abolition, um, radical racial justice, you kind of got looked at like you had three heads. Um, <laughs> and so, you know, I needed to know that I wasn't bringing someone into my organization and exposing people in prison to someone who was going to mock them, make parodies of them, caricatures out of them, but someone who was really going to trust, uh, that we could trust, um, and that we could build a relation, long-term relationship with. And so, you know, timing has also been essential in this whole process and I, I, I pray for Erica that she never has to endure another 10-year project. But I, <laughs> I do think that the fact that it took 10 years was essential to be able to be truly part of our movement to be able to capture it um, and to be able to portray it uh, accurately and truthfully for what, what we were trying to accomplish and who we were. Can I? Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, yeah, no. no I, was saying, on, I, I want to just add to that is that also, like you, like Cynthia said, this has been a 20 year journey for us. And so when, when I met Erica and I was introduced to her, um, I was also at a place of feeling somewhat exploited by so much storytelling. Right. Um, and which sometimes that can happen with uh, film participants, those who are you're capturing some documenting victimizations and stuff, even the families like if you look at like um, some of the families like Brianna Taylor family, they're constantly having to go through this place of storytelling for shock value and different things like that. And you can feel somewhat exploited. And so I was feeling like, look, I'm tired of talking to my story. Um, you know, like, what, why are you here? you know, so why are you here? And Erica was like, well, she, so she put the camera down. She put her, you know, thing down. She said, what do you need? I said, I need a friend right now. I need, I need someone I can talk to right now. Like I just, I just need someone to talk to. And so she said, well, I'll, I'm here. But it was that in that moment that I began to trust her because it wasn't just about her getting her idea or, you know, this project, are trying to um, persuade me and get me to trust her for a specific thing. At that moment, I recognized that she cared about me as an individual person, as a woman who have gone through so much different layers of trauma. And so she she didn't she did not ask me immediately after that. It still took a few months after that to where she then presented the idea again. Um, as I was pulled back to testify, but I respected her on that level. She continued to do what she did with Justice Now, but it made me respect her on a whole different level that I then began to open up to her and was willing to get behind her camera. Well, I know, Cynthia, you say at the, the end of the documentary that this is indicative of a larger problem and there's the documentary touches on sexual assault in the prison system. You know, with COVID, we've seen how the prison system has been reacting to a lot of different things. But do we know if there's any update on the medical community with COVID and incarceration? Have things gotten better in any in any sense? No. <laughs> so no. I mean, not what I figured. <laughs> yeah, I mean, th there is a way to provide uh, better health care and uh, a level of compassion and respect to people in prison around their health needs. And that is to let people out of prison um, and start rendering prisons obsolete. Uh, prisons are throughout their entire history have been um, the subject of efforts to reduce the uh, horrific abuses and violence within them. There's never been a safe, compassionate prison. Um, and so, you know, it's not been surprising that um, the COVID rates in jails and prisons nationally are spectacularly terrible. I mean, even in the San Francisco Bay Area, so in Northern California where I am, it's one of the metropolitan areas with the lowest COVID rate um, in the entire country. Um, but our jails and our prisons are, are crisis points. 
Um, and we're even sort of fudging the data and not counting those exposures within our county data. Um, so it's, you know, we're, we are still forgetting that that population exists and, and still failing to treat people in prison as human beings. And that is fundamentally an extension of slavery too, right? We're um, systematically exposing people of color, vulnerable communities to an environment where we control whether or not they live or die. Um, and, uh, you know, COVID is sort of magnifying, putting a lens on all this. Well, I think to, to that question as well, you know, I know you and you and Kelly at the end of the documentary are working on the reparations bill. Uh, has there been any update on on that, especially with COVID kind of slowing everything down? Sure. Um, so we were really on the precipice of getting a reparations bill passed in California. Um, and our bill actually would not just do reparations for people who were historically sterilized under historic eugenics, but also contemporarily in California women's prisons. But it also would have mandated that the state have to notify people that they were sterilized. You know, Kelly and I kind of stumbled across the fact that she was sterilized almost, you know, by accident, right? Um, and there are many people clearly who were sterilized in California either while giving birth or during other abdominal surgeries who have no knowledge whatsoever. So the bill would have done that. With COVID, uh, suddenly the California legislature was wary to spend money on anything um, and our bill died. We're still pushing a budget request and we have high hopes that will pass. We're encouraging everyone who watches the film to go to our film's website, uh, bellyofthebeastfilm.com and sign the petition demanding reparations as well as notification of survivors uh, in California. And this hopefully will serve as a model that can be replicated across the country to help ensure that these abuses don't continue and resurrect elsewhere. Um, you know, we have never had accountability and if you, justice requires accountability and behavioral change. Um, and we've never had accountability or acknowledgement of these abuses on a state level and it keeps resurf resurfacing. So we feel like this reparations push is essential. So again, please go to our website and sign the petition. Kelly, I don't know if you wanna add anything no, no, she said it all. Okay, okay. <laughs> I love well, it. I, that's my, <laughs> Cynthia makes my job easier. I love it. <laughs> uh, well, the, uh, the next question I had, you know, the documentary opens with the interview of, of Kelly during uh, the, the lawsuit for, for her sterilization. And we go back to that a couple of times and you get to see how she is essentially interrogated for her past. Um, Erica, what, what made you want to open the film with, with that interview and utilize it in a way to show how we're slowly seeing now how male authority figures tend to uh, ask the wrong questions when they're interviewing uh, victims of domestic violence? Yeah, this, you know, going back to something that Kelly mentioned um, earlier, we thought that the film was done at the end of 2018. We thought that the film was ready to be released into the world. And um, I had been speaking with the attorneys who represented Kelly during her trial and ac about accessing her case file for fact checking purposes. And the law firm that had taken on Kelly's case had merged with another law firm and only one of, one of the t attorneys um, on her case actually was still there who had made the merge. And once we got in touch with him, it took months to actually track down the files. And they were in this like random offsite storage facility in the middle of California, in the middle of nowhere. And we were so fortunate that he, he believed in the film Mm. and remain committed to uncovering them. So really, we didn't think that this, these files would have anything, mm. you know, interesting in them. It was really just for fact checking purposes. But within the files, once they were finally uncovered, there was a DVD of Kelly's deposition. And upon viewing, we completely restructured the film around it. And the deposition footage really serves as our introduction to imprisonment. Mm and then later placing us in the midst of an unfolding trial. And then finally, also as a storytelling device, evoking kind of both past and present, as you see Kelly pursuing her own dreams, you know, one of the most, I think, poignant moments in the deposition, you know, 
there are many poignant moments, but when, when Kelly asks, can I hope? And um, am I allowed to hope? And then, you know, carefully describes her hopes and dreams, which she has fully, you know, realized and beyond at this point in her life. So I thought that was a really, really important point. Angela and I worked, um, uh, you know, really combed through that deposition footage. And I don't know, Angela, if you want to speak about that, that process too, or, or Kelly, if you want to add as well. Well, I just wanted to add that, um, you know, with friends and family who've seen the film, everybody mentions that moment. And I think it's because you can, for two reasons. One, Kelly's so young in that footage. And so you really, you see, um, how just vulnerable she is in that moment, but also in the film, a lot of people are talking about things that have happened sort of in the past, but it's kind of one of the moments where you are having, you are in the present with a person going through an experience. And there's just a different energy to that when you watch it and you, you feel it in a different way and you remember it. So, you know, we thought it was really important to uh, have that moment in the film. And, and I'm, we're just yeah. really, that somebody came across that DVD. Yeah. Um, what I want to add to that moment when you were talking about um, just that male presence and how I was interrogated is that I, um, in which we talk about this in the work that I do, that most women of color are not seen as victims, period. We're not seen as victims. We're not, we, we're not given the same compassion, um, whether if it's sexual assault, domestic violence, um, police brutality, death, whatever. We're, there's some way or another that most women of color are villainized in some way, um, discredited in some way, to not make what happened to them um, as impactful as it really is. And that's what you were seeing in that moment for me when I was watching it, when I was getting the opportunity to sit back and watch it when I seen Belly, I was like, damn, that's really messed up how they were doing me because I was on trial all over again for while I was in prison. It really had anything, nothing to do with what was happening with me at that moment, but they were trying to discredit uh, me as, a, as an individual and make me look a certain way. But that's what happens. And so that's what you were seeing in that moment, which is that um, the lack of fairness and compassion, and which is the reason why, even though I, I respect all of what, um, what, what Cynthia does, but I, I'm at the point now where I do not respect the law. Having gone through a trial, being a domestic violence victim with an iron burn on my chest and an iron burn on my arm and still being convicted of 25 years to life and then after after being incarcerated for protecting myself and my self and my protecting myself and my abuser with my children then i'm sterilized and to be placed back on trial again where's where's that i'm in both situations i'm trying to defend myself in this court of law and i realized that the court of law has nothing to do with emotions it has nothing to do with compassion it has nothing to do with the human experience. It is based on the ability to present a theory that, that you know, on some circumstantial evidence. And really, I have no respect for the law whatsoever anymore because I realize is that it has nothing to do with what's humanly right, what's morally right. And that's what you were seeing in that moment. I want to give Kelly the, the last question that I have. At, at the end of the film, you talk about trying to find your, your happy ending. And if you, you get one, I wanted to ask, you know, with obviously 2020 being a nightmare for everybody, I mean, I'm hoping that you found your happy ending. Did you? You know what? Actually, um, yes, my happy ending has shifted. And the reason why it has shifted is because, um, I, it took it took the film it took it took the making of this film and for me to see the journey to see myself i've been so caught up in surviving in crisis moment overcoming trauma trying to heal 
that I didn't recognize how far I had come. And so now when I look on the screen, I see a family. I don't, I don't see subjects. I don't see producers or directors. I see a family. That's a happy ending. On it, I saw that I was able to walk the stage and I had surrounded by other family members. That's a happy ending. Um, when I heard myself say that I hope to work with battered women, I've personally worked with thousands of women, like literally thousands of women throughout this 10 year of my career, that happy ending. And so um, I, I am blessed. It did not, prison did not do to me what it was designed to do. It, it might have, you know, broken me for a moment, but it didn't shatter me. And I, in that I was rebirthed in a place, in a very, very dark place. Um, the, the title Belly of the Beast is, um, it has so many different meanings to it because of course, belly of the beast, meaning that in the heart, in the core, in the nucleus, in the center of something that is so, you know, um, hor horrific and heinous and stuff. But it's also a place where if you look at it biblically, where Jonah um, was sentenced when he was, you know, he was running from something and then he found his purpose and he accepted his purpose before he was let back out as well and so there's so many different metaphors that you can get with just the title but for me the bell and it also be the belly of the beast the beast of how people see us see us as ugly being but at the same time what we have in our belly you know being able to reproduce and everything is like that but i was really truly rebirthed and um in this film it gives me a legacy um in which I don't believe that it would have came in such a way had not I been entrusted. I'm gonna say this one last thing, Kristen, and I'm gonna hand it off to everybody else. I now ask myself, what would have happened if I won my case, right? Because usually when people win their case, they, you know, they, I had, I would have had enough money to start my own life, buy a home for me and my children, maybe finance my own business. I may not have, I may not have um, been sold in the fight had I won my case because I would have been grateful and I would have went on about my life. And that would have been the so-called happy ending. But life and purpose had, it had a bigger meaning and it was other women. And then as we began to fight and we were so angry and outraged, it made us fight on and look further and investigate further. And for that, we were able to discover that not only did it happen to me, but thousands of other women. And not only that, women of disability, women of mental health issues, and Latino women for, for, for over 100 years. So this sterilization thing has been happening for over 100 years. And so because of it, because of that, I found pain, I found purpose out of pain. And so that's what I want to end with. This documentary made me cry and Kelly's going to make me cry right now. So, you know, I think that's a good, good note to, to end, end this with. But I want to thank all of you for, for participating and giving insight into this amazing film. Cynthia, what is the website if people want to sign the petition, find ways to help? I want to make sure that they have all the information uh, to hopefully keep the fight going. Sure, uh, to get involved, uh, to do screenings, to sign the petition, to uh, think about how camp your own campaign, if you're with an organization that wants to do work, can use the film, you can go to bellyofthebeastfilm.com um, and get all that information there. And we really do want people to use this film to make change. I mean, my hope is that uh, this film is so much bigger than just Kelly's story. Uh, that, in it, that it's an inspiration for people to see that if you persevere and work with others and, and team up, you can make huge change happen. So our hope is that we'll continue to use the film to make that kind of change. We thank everybody watching and hopefully you enjoy the film. So thank you so much.